Welcome to section six, Go Routine. Now, Go Routines, if you don't know about them, is one of the major features in the Go programming language that anytime you talk to anybody about the language, this is what they bring up as one of the core features. And today, we're gonna start on that journey that's gonna allow us to write some really interesting Go application. So far, we've been learning some nice things about Go and some of the features with maps and slices and so on, and those things are nice. But Go routine, as you will see, and some of the other things that we're gonna do, especially in the next section, is what really makes Go stand out as a new and different language. Okay, let's jump in. So, of course, we're gonna do some basic things. We're gonna look at what is a Go routine. We're gonna look at how to create Go routines. Then we're gonna get into a few more advanced things. We will see that once we can create Go routines, we will need to worry about when they finish and how to make sure that we wait long enough for them to complete their work. And that's gonna lead us to talk about synchronization. And then we'll also talk about some pitfalls, some things you should look out for. Well, we're gonna kick things off in this section, of course, with lecture one. And our objectives for this lecture are to cover how to create Go routines. And we'll do that using name functions and anonymous functions, which are the functions that you create without names. We'll also figure out what a Go routine is, and we'll do that indirectly by trying to understand the responsibility of a Go routine. Then we're gonna talk about how your program ends. Now, this may seem like something we should have covered in section two, and we did. We said that your program ends when main ends. Well, now we're gonna be creating Go routine. It's time that we make sure that we understand when your program ends, and some of the consequences of your program ending when you have Go routines. So before we get into any sort of coding, let's just get some concepts and terminology out of the way. Let's talk about sequential functions. So what is a sequential function? Let's say I have two functions, one called producer and one called consumer. And what I want is the producer to create some data which my consumer will then use. So in that case, my producer must run first to create this data that I want my consumer to use. And then the consumer can run. But notice when I call my producer function, it runs the completion first. Because let's say I wanted to produce 10,000 random numbers. Even after producing half of them, it is possible that my consumer could probably start working on the half of those numbers, but there's no way to get my consumer to start working. My producer must run to completion first before my consumer can work. So this is how we've been writing code so far, and these are sequential functions. Now, there's another way you can imagine things happening. You can imagine that if I could run things concurrently, which would require not only that my functions be written in such a way that they're independent. Now, that doesn't mean that a consumer doesn't need the data from the producer. What it means, though, is that if I could write things in such a way that once the producer produces some set of data, I can probably pass it over to my consumer, my consumer could start working on it given the opportunity, then I can say that how these functions, if I can interleave their execution, I can say that how they run concurrently. Now, not only do I need to write my code in such a way to make sure that how anything the consumer does doesn't manipulate or trip up the producer in, in a negative way and vice versa. So you can imagine, let's say my producer is writing into an array. And then even if I could stop it and let my consumer consume some of that data, it's possible then that my consumer might try to access information or manipulate the area in a way that can hurt how the producer produce information or cause the producer to incorrectly start writing at the wrong location and all these other things. So if this doesn't make sense, you will see why in a minute. So what is P0? P0 is what I'll call my processor. So we had the same diagram before when we talked about sequential function. The only thing I added was P0 to mean a processor. For us, we're gonna say a processor is simply hardware, a piece of hardware that can execute code. That's it. We're not gonna draw any distinction between hyperthreading cores, multiple cores within one physical CPU or anything like that. Once we have hardware that can execute code, we'll call that a processor. So if I have a processor, and now I want to do the same thing, but again, we're going to make sure that our producer and consumer can run concurrently. So what does that mean? Well, it means then that if, for example, I started my consumer and there's no data for it to consume, well, that's not a problem. The requirement that a producer must run first was removed. And so now I can free to start my consumer. It sees there's no data and it simply blocks or waits or something like that but it's not a big problem. And I can then run my producer afterward, which produces the data that the consumer need, and then things just sort of, the execution interleave at that point, 
and it doesn't really matter since they're independent, my consumer could return even before my producer finishes. And that's fine too, because remember, the requirement is that they're independent, they're free to do whatever they want. And so even if my producer produces data that a consumer doesn't consume, no big deal. So once we can write code properly that satisfy concurrency or this pattern of where these two functions can interleave their execution without tripping up the other one or causing an error in the other function because they're independent, then you can get parallelism for free. On this slide, I have pretty much the same thing I had before, except now I have two processors. We know that because I said a processor is just a piece of hardware that can execute code. I have P0 and P1 now, so I have two processors. I still have my functions. So how are things different now? Well, let's imagine that for some reason, I can launch these same two functions concurrently. Well, because they're already independent, they've been written to be concurrent, which means that though they can run independently. Well, now that I have multiple processors, I really don't have to wait in any one function for the other. Each function can do a bit of work, and then assuming there's some way for them to communicate their work that the other need, then they can literally run in parallel. And so that's why once you can write concurrent functions, and you have the mechanism and the feature in the language and the operating system to allow you to run concurrent code, you get parallelism for free if you have multiple processors. If you have one processor, nothing changes. You still get to run your code very nicely with the ability that if you ever get more processors or move it to architecture with more processors, you get parallelism for free. We can compare concurrency versus parallelism. And concurrency is not parallelism. Notice when we had the code that was running concurrently, they weren't running in parallel. Piece of it run one after the other when we had one processor. But what happened, it was the way we wrote our code allow us to run in a concurrent way. If you don't write your code with concurrency in mind, then you cannot get the benefit of concurrency and therefore you cannot get parallelism, even if you have multiple processors. Parallelism is how the code execute. So concurrency is how we wrote the code and once we have the mechanism in the language or whatever to be able to create concurrent functions, well, we can get parallelism if we have multiple processors and you get it for free. You don't have to do anything fancy. So before we go look at code, I encourage you to read this slide. I wouldn't read it for you, but basically it's Rob Pike, one of the designer of the Go programming language, talking about how concurrency is not parallelism. And at the end of this lecture, in your reference material, there is a link to a YouTube video which you give a talk about concurrency is not parallelism. So I encourage you to read this slide and to watch that video. Let's go look at some code of how you to create Go routines, and then we'll come back and review with some slides and diagrams what we see in code and see if that wouldn't help us remember and really have a picture in mind when we talk about concurrency and Go routines. So as before, I'm in main.go in lecture one for section six. And basically it's just a function I call producer. It takes an ID. And what my producer does is it prints out some messages. Right now, my main function doesn't call this producer. So we can go ahead and call our producer. Let's give it the number one. And let's compile, run our code and see what we get. And surprise, surprise, it's just five messages saying that it was produced by producer one. Well, we can call this producer multiple times, so let's do that. And we will run the code and we shouldn't be surprised at the results. So there we go. So this is sequential function call. We've called producer one to do some work, then we call producer two. What if we wanted producer one and producer two to be run concurrently? Well, right now these functions are independent. There's nothing that happening in the producer one function that matter when we make another call to that function. So we could have different functions, but in this case, um, each time you call producer, it's independent from any previous invocation. We could imagine writing a function where each time you call it, somehow it increments like a global variable, and then therefore each call to that function truly is not really independent from any previous call because each call sort of manipulate the state of some shared global variable. But here we don't have that. So they're truly independent. So how do we make these function calls concurrent? Well, we introduce something called the Go keyword, and we simply put the Go keyword before a function. And what this says to the Go runtime is create a Go routine for me to manage the execution of this function. 
Now I'll explain that in a bit. And when we get back to the slide, you'll see what I mean. I didn't have to change my producer in any way. I simply introduced the go keyword in front of the function call. I noticed it's still a function call. So let's go run our code and see what happens. And there you go. Look at what's happening. The results sort of differs here. I didn't see any result from producer one, but there are times when I run it and I saw some output from producer one. So here, for example, um, producer one produced some message, but notice what happened. It looks like producer one no longer always get to run first. And that makes sense because what we said is if we can run our functions concurrently, it allows for the interleaving of the function call. So here it looked like function two was running for a little bit. It got to produce one message. Then execution went into function one and function one got to produce all its messages. And then it went back to function two. Now you might be wondering, well then what happened here? Well, this is one of the pitfalls we'll talk about in a bit. And to really illustrate this, let's run both of these functions now as go routines under go routine, the management of go routines. So now we have created go routines to call these named functions. Notice these are named functions, right? And let's run it and see. Now we could run this as many times as we like. And chances are we're very unlikely to see any output. So what is happening? Well, this comes back to what I mentioned about when your program ends. What is happening is that we're asking the go runtime to launch a go routine to run this producer function with this parameter one. We're saying launch another go routine to run this producer function with the parameters two. But before any one of these functions could get to run, our main function returns. It returns immediately after just saying, hey, create a go routine for this guy, create a go routine for that guy, and it returns immediately. And therefore, we never had the time for these functions to run because the main program exits. So that tells us when you create go routines, again, we don't know what go routines are yet. I just said go routines are created to manage the execution of a function. Okay, take my word for it for now, but We'll get to that in a bit. But once your main functions end, your program ends, and it doesn't matter how many Go routines you created, they will get killed. Let me prove to you that these functions run if we were to cause the main function to pause for a bit, um, maybe one second, and that should give our two Go routines the opportunity to run these functions. So let's do that. So what I'm doing here is calling time that sleep to say sleep for a little bit. And you see what it says, the sleep function pauses the current go routine for at least the duration. And so here the duration is one times that second. So times that second is some unit that represent duration. And we are doing it for one second. So let's run it again and see. And now you see my program sort of waits there even after the, these functions finish their work. It sort of still hang around, but at least now when we run our code, we're going to always see our 10 messages. Um, of course, they appear differently and we can't control that because it depends on when they get to run. All right. So the messages might interleave. We don't know. OK. All right. Now I can reduce this time because I think one second is probably too much. And this would probably still work. And it seems to have be enough time, one milliseconds, seems to be enough time for me to run for both go routines to get launched. All right. So that is one of the pitfalls with creating go routines. Make sure that you give them enough time to run. So if you create a go routine and then you don't see any work get, getting done from it, ask yourself, is your program ending before your go routine can get to do any work? All right. So I said that we can create go routine from name function. We can also create go routine from anonymous function. So let's create go routine from anonymous functions. So my foo function here is very simple. It just writes some messages out again, just like my producer function. And we know that oh, I can create a go routine to manage this function execution by using the go keyword. So this we expect to work. 
Okay, so that's working. And again, the, when the messages show up, I don't care because it's dependent on when they get scheduled by the runtime and so on. I don't care. I just care that oh, they do the work I intend them for them to do. And that seems to be happening. So how can we make this an anonymous function? Remember, this name, foo, represents this function. So why don't we just take this function and put it in place of foo? Now, since I put that in place, I don't really need the name anymore, so I can remove remove that. And of course, I don't need the function foo. And so if I save, notice how this is an anonymous function, which we, when we cover functions in section two, we said we can create anonymous functions, store them to a variable, or we can simply call them. And that's what we're doing. We create an anonymous function, and then we call it immediately. And that's what we see when we do a go, create go routines, we have to use the go keyword, a function call, not just a function name, but it's a function call. So be sure when you use anonymous functions, and you want to create go routines for them, make sure that you call that function. So if there was a parameter I needed to pass my function, of course I would be passing it here, the actual value, and this is where I would specify my parameter list. Okay, so let's run this and see what we get. And notice it works the exactly the same way, so you can create go routines from named function or anonymous function. We also see that you, can, you must give time for your go routines to complete their work because there's that issue of if you don't get your main function ends too fast, then your go routine won't have time to launch and do the work. Now, once we use the go keyword on our function, our functions, well, they're already defined, they're just regular functions. We haven't changed them in any way. So for example, in my anonymous function here, I can in turn call the producer function again, and let's call it producer three. And this is just another function that I can call. It's just that with the go keyword, I can launch a go routine to manage the execution of that function or the running of that function. So we'll run our code. And you can see that sure enough, producer three, it, messages will always appear after foo because foo messages get printed out first, followed by the function call to producer three. But in terms of the messages from producer one and two, they can be interleaved between the foo and producer three messages. And that's exactly what you see here. Foo messages occurred. And then once that finished, and it started to produce producer tree message, that function, that go routine, somehow was interrupted. And then the go routine that's responsible for producer two got to run and so on. So you don't want to try and think too much about exactly. That's why I said that so it's important that these functions are independent. They don't have any sort of dependency between them that require that, you know, producer one run for us or producer two run for us or anything of that sort, because once you make them go routines, we do not know when they will get to run. All we know is that they do some work and their work should be independent. In the next section, we will talk about how we can pass information between them so that they can do coordinate on doing some useful things. That's it. Take care. See you in the next lecture.